The firemen died, why were they mostly white? Because they had the jobs. Why were most of the firemen who died on 9-11 white firemen? Because that union had been so racist that they couldn't penetrate. Now don't tell me that black people couldn't score enough to be a fireman on. on a job in New York City. Now I had firemen from other cities like Los Angeles not only point that point out to me, but then when those who were heroic in 9-11, right, uh, who were people of color, were to be celebrated in a statue, they erased the black face in deference to this notion that these were white firemen operating. So my point to you is that, A, quota systems have not operated and do not operate for the most part uh, in notions of affirmative action, even when people say we want to reach a certain number. Number two, that uh, people have, I think, seized on this as reverse discrimination, not only in the workplace, but in, say, University of Michigan, where they said we should give out seats in a schoolroom to people who are unqualified or underqualified when you have overqualified white people. F slow down. Who told you that the white student was automatically qualified because you didn't get in when there were other white students who scored better than you who didn't get in, right? So that the litmus test, the determining factor for who gets in a place is not simply a score. When you go to Harvard when they were all white, let's just say before black people and all minorities got in, what happened when there was a competition, but it goes on even now, but what happened when there was a competition for, say, uh, 900 seats and 50,000 people applied? Well, you all couldn't get in, and a lot of them were smart. Let me see, this person is from the Northeast. We haven't had a violent playing person from Niagara at Harvard, but we've had three coming from the South. We give the nine to the person from Niagara because we need a demographic diversity, that is, from Niagara in the East versus from the South. Then they made the distinction, whose daddy went here, whose mama went here, mm. right? So when you begin to talk about how uh, people are accepted into uh, a university or a college or just assigned a particular um, a good or a service like a job, it's not simply about the merit, though the merit is critical. And I don't want to avoid your point. So it's not reaching down to number 89 unless the historic inequality has been so overwhelming that the courts have mandated that you begin to erase those lists and create new ones in the present. Because don't forget, the lists are predicated upon a history of inequality already. When they destroy those lists, which some white firefighters, for instance, have fought, the problem is, is that those who have now gained new competency and new skill sets to be able to compete cannot get in either through seniority uh, and only by the occasional admission that is provided for them uh, when they go into these tests. So the, so the notion of jumping from 3 to 89 is not really the case for the most part when we're talking about the distribution of these guys. Good, but you want to come back in? Yeah. yeah. Go as long as you want. Right, okay. But uh, there will be some students who will be leaving for a two o'clock class, and I don't want you to feel offended when they get up. I got you. Okay, no, no, no. But I want him to come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you expect to be racial, racially and genderly hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. blind. Let, let's, let's get there so we can get to the mic. If you expect these opportunities to be racially and genderly and geographically blind, anytime you feel, well, we have to reach out to do this, or you say a nod on the list, what is a nod other than skipping a more qualified? That's all. That's not blind anymore. When Babe Ruth got 714 home runs, he was playing in a league where no black people were allowed, no Latino boys were allowed. Because if some Latinos and blacks were playing, he might not have a home run record. But he was the best among white men. That's not fair. That's not equal. So when I say to you, open it up so everybody can participate. If you got a history where white men have exclusively had the preserve for years and years and years and years, then you open it up to black and Latino and other people, and you say, let's play by one set of rules, but you say Josh Gibson, who hit 899 home runs, doesn't count because he didn't play in that league, then you've already disqualified the person who's already bettered that person when you say unqualified. Unqualified according to who? Unqualified because white men have had the history of opportunity to exercise that job. And I'm saying to you, when I look around at every union in America, when I look around at every civil service opportunity, most of those jobs white men had to themselves. They weren't, in, they weren't highly skilled. And when they were highly skilled, they got skilled because they were able to pass those skills along. And then they hired their incompetent brothers and sisters who took have those jobs when they were qualified. When they were qualified, black people couldn't have them. Are you telling me you think that Barack Obama's the first black guy to be president? No. 
Jesse Jackson could have been president. Frederick Douglass could have been president. So I'm saying to you, when the rules, I'm, all I'm saying to you, when the rules precluded the opportunity of equally qualified people, that created an, an inequality that allowed white men who were mediocre, who had no skill sets, George Bush, bless his heart, hold on, hold on. Admitting he was a C student, but got into college because his daddy called somebody when other qualified, more better, were better qualified white and black and Latino people yeah. couldn't get in. So my point to you is that there have been so many cases and instances, historically and systematically, where better qualified people of color couldn't get in, couldn't get a job, and so affirmative action is to redress the inequality that exists because often mediocre or just average white people could get a job where better qualified black and Latino people couldn't. That's all I'm saying, but you want to come back at me. Well, that's the whole thing. Say again? It's the vote of the people to put in yeah, the yeah, policy, yeah. so it's, right. it's everybody's cumulative. Right, but when black people couldn't vote before 1965, we couldn't, we couldn't vote nobody. This is not. I get it. These people weren't even born in 1965. Oh, yeah, well, hold on. See, that's what I'm saying. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Here's my point, though. But you weren't born when the Constitution was written, but you still take advantage of it. Oh! You weren't born when the in terms of schools, in terms of benefits, in terms of social standing. And by the way, I'd like to see another white person stand up to maybe argue with that particular viewpoint if you happen to disagree. <laughs> if you happen to disagree. Uh, if you happen to, don't just let the black man sit up here and take this. Let me see other white people who might want to make an argument with my brother right here. All right, all right. All right. Well, guys. To my, my brother. My name is Bill Bradley. President of the United Child of the NAACP. Are you a white man? <laughs> okay, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was asking for a white man. Before you start, I just want to know what I'm a white brother. I want a white brother. Let me just stand up and help you. All right. All right. All right. Who are your people, though? Members of the NAACP. Okay. I'm also the chairman of the White Falls University. Right. I just wanted a white person to respond. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Oh, yeah. I guess, but we own a we'll momentum. Get to that. I mean, we own a momentum. I just want a white person to immediately respond. I'm going to say, Joe's right. Okay. Yeah. Joe, do that. Then we have you speak. I just want well, Joe to respond to him, and then I want to go first to the president. That's all. All right. Go ahead. I don't want to lose that momentum. Then I want you to speak because I know you're a brilliant guy. But I want a white person to speak to a white person so, about okay. white privilege. <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Joe. I'm from Niagara Falls, New York. I'm also okay. I'm also in the NAACP. I know Bill personally. Um, He's a very bright young man too, as you can see. But to address the issue that this gentleman is uh, speaking about, first of all, civil service tests are not necessarily the best predictor of one's ability to perform. Amen. The union rules have been designed to exclude certain kinds of people. So I think we need to start all over. I want to first of all welcome you to my community. Thank you, sir. You're sitting not too far from the home of the Niagara Movement, where in 1905, Betty E.B. Du Bois and several other people yep. came to create the institution that became the NAACP. And yet today I stand here with you having the argument, the discussion, the conversation that this entire country needs to be engaged in right now. Mm -hmm. This man just hit the nail on the head. This is what I would call a sense of privilege that has come along with the uh, systemic racism that has found its way into the system and put us where we are. Let me give you some statistics. The city of Niagara Falls right now has a school population of about 7,000 students. Mm -hmm. About 35% of whom are African Americans. Mm -hmm. The ratio of African American teachers to those students is about 5%. What's wrong with that? Fewer than 50% of our students who enter the ninth grade, African-American males, are graduating. What's wrong with that? 